Chronicles of Narnia, The Magician's Nephew, by C.S. Lewis, Chapter 7. What Happened at the Front Door Now, slave, how long am I to wait for my chariot? thundered the witch. Uncle Andrew cowered away from her. Now that she was really present, all the silly thoughts he had had while looking at himself in the glass were oozing out of him. But Aunt Letty at once got up from her knees and came over to the center of the room. And who is this young person, Andrew, may I ask? said Aunt Letty in icy tones. "'Distinguished foreigner, v very important person,' he stammered. "'Rubbish,' said Aunt Letty, and then, turning to the witch, "'Get out of my house this moment, you shameless hussy, or I'll send for the police.' She thought the witch must be someone out of a circus, and she did not approve of bare arms. "'What woman is this?' said Jadis. "'Down on your knees, minion, before I blast you.' "'No strong language in this house, if you please, young woman,' said Aunt Letty. Instantly, as it seemed to Uncle Andrew, the queen towered up to an even greater height. Fire flashed from her eyes. She flung out her arm with the same gesture and the ho same horrible-sounding words that had lately turned the palace gates of Charon into dust. But nothing happened except that Aunt Letty, thinking that those horrible words were meant to be ordinary English, said— I thought as much. The woman is drunk. Drunk. She can't even speak clearly. It must have been a terrible moment for the witch when she suddenly realized that her power of turning people into dust, which had been quite real in her own world, was not going to work in ours. But she did not lose her nerve even for a second. Without wasting a thought on her disappointment, she lunged forward, caught Aunt Letty round the neck and knees, raised her high above her head as if she had been no heavier than a doll, and threw her across the room. While Aunt Letty was still hurtling through the air, the housemaid, who was having a beautifully exciting morning, put her head in at the door and said, "'If you please, sir, the ansoms come.' "'Lead on, slave,' said the witch to Uncle Andrew. He began muttering something about regrettable violence must really protest, but— at a single glance from Jadis, he became speechless. She drove him out of the room and out of the house, and Diggory came running down the stairs just in time to see the front door close behind them. Jiminy, he said, she's loose in London, and with Uncle Andrew, I wonder what on earth is going to happen now. Oh, Master Diggory, said the housemaid, who was really having a wonderful day. I think Miss Kettley's hurt herself somehow. So they both rushed into the drawing room to find out what had happened. If Aunt Letty had fallen on bare boards or even on the carpet, I suppose all her bones would have been broken. But by great good luck, she had fallen on the mattress. Aunt Letty was a very tough old lady. Aunts often were in those days. After she had some salvatel and sat still for a few moments, she said there was nothing the matter with her except for a few bruises. Very soon, she was taking charge of the situation. Sarah, she said to the housemaid, who had never had such a day before, go around to the police station at once and tell them there's a dangerous lunatic at large. I will take Mrs. Kirk's lunch up myself. Mrs. Kirk was, of course, Diggory's mother. When Mother's lunch had been sent to, Diggory and Aunt Letty had their own. After that, he did some hard thinking. The problem was how to get the witch back to her own world, or at any rate, out of ours, as soon as possible. Whatever happened, she must not be allowed to go rampaging about the house. Mother must not see her. And, if possible, she must not be allowed to go rampaging about London, either. Diggory had not been in the drawing room when she tried to blast Aunt Letty, but he had seen her blast the gates at Chairn. So he knew her terrible powers and did not know she had lost any of them by coming into our own world. And he knew that she meant to conquer our world. At the present moment, as far as he could see, she might be blasting Buckingham Palace or the Houses of Parliament, and it was almost certain that quite a number of policemen had now been reduced to little heaps of dust. And there didn't seem to be anything he could do about that. But the rings do seem to work like magnets, thought Diggory. If I can only touch her and then slip on my yellow, we shall both go into the wood between the worlds. I wonder, will she go all faint again there? Was that something the place does to her, or was it only the shock of being pulled out of her own world? But I suppose I'll have to risk that. And how am I to find the beast? 
I don't suppose Aunt Letty would let me go out, not unless I said where I was going, and I haven't any more than two pence. I'd need any amount of money before buses and trams if I went looking all over London. Anyway, I haven't the faintest idea where to look. I wonder if Uncle Andrew is still with her. It seemed in the end that the only thing he could do was to wait and hope that Uncle Andrew and the witch would come back. If they did, he must rush out and get hold of the witch and put on his yellow ring before she had the chance to get into the house. This meant that he must watch out for the front door like a cat watching a mouse's hole. He dared not leave his post for a moment. So he went to the dining room and glued his face, as they say, to the window. It was a bow window, which you could see at the steps coming up to the front door and see up and down the street, so that no one could reach the front door without your knowing. I wonder what Polly's doing, thought Diggory. He wondered about this a good deal as the first slow half hour ticked on. But you need not wonder, for I'm going to tell you. She had got home late for her dinner, with her shoes and stockings very wet. And when they asked her where she had been and what on earth she had been doing, she said she had been out with Diggory Kirk. Under further questioning, she said she got her feet wet in a pool of water and that the pool was in a wood. Asked where the wood was, she said she didn't know. Asked if it was in one of the parks, she said truthfully enough that she supposed it might be a sort of park. From all this, Polly's mother got the idea that Polly had gone off without telling anyone to some part of London she didn't know and got into a strange park and amused herself jumping into puddles. As a result, she was told that she had been very naughty indeed, and that she wouldn't be allowed to play with that Kirk boy any more if anything of the sort happened ever again. Then she was given dinner with all the nice parts left out, and sent to bed for two solid hours. It was a thing that happened to one quite often in those days. So while Diggory was staring out of the dining room window, Polly was lying in bed, and both were thinking how terribly slowly the time could go. I think myself I would rather have been in Polly's position. She had only to wait for the end of her two hours. But every few minutes, Diggory would hear a cab or a baker's van or a butcher's boy coming around the corner and think, here she comes, and then find it wasn't. And in between these false alarms, for what seemed hours and hours, the clock ticked on and one big fly, high up and far out of reach, buzzed against the window. It was one of those houses that get very quiet and dull in the afternoon, and always seemed to smell of mutton. During his long watching and waiting, one small thing happened which I shall have to mention, because something important came of it later on. A lady called with some grapes for Diggory's mother, and as the dining room door was open, Diggory couldn't help overhearing Aunt Letty and the lady as they talked in the hall. "'What lovely grapes!' came Aunt Letty's voice. "'I'm sure if anything could do her good, these would. But poor dear little Mabel!' I'm afraid it would need fruit from the land of youth to help her now. Nothing in this world will do much. Then they both lowered their voices and said a lot more that he could not hear. If he had heard that bit about the land of youth a few days ago, he would have thought Aunt Letty was just talking without meaning in anything in particular, the way grown-ups do, and it wouldn't have interested him. He almost thought so now. But suddenly it flashed upon his mind that he now knew even if Aunt Letty didn't, that there really were other worlds and that he himself had been in one of them. At that rate, there might be a real land of youth somewhere. There might be almost anything. There might be fruit in some other world that would really cure his mother. And oh, oh, well, you know how it feels if you begin hoping for something that you want desperately badly. You almost fight against the hope because it's too good to be true. You've been disappointed so often before. That was how Diggory felt. But it was no good trying to throttle this hope. It might really, really, it just might be true. So many odd things had happened already. And he had the magic rings. There must be worlds you could get into through every pool in the wood. He could hunt through them all. And then Mother well again, everything right again. He forgot all about watching for the witch. His hand was already going into the pocket where he kept the yellow ring, when all at once he heard a sound of galloping. Hello, what's that? thought Diggory. Fire engine? I wonder what house is on fire. Great Scott, it's coming here. Why, it's her. I needn't tell you who he met by her. First came the hansom. There was no one in the driver's seat, 
on the roof, not sitting, but standing on the roof, swaying with superb balance as it came at full speed round the corner, with one wheel in the air, was Jadis the Queen of Queens and the Terror of Chern. Her teeth were bought, bared, her eyes shone like fire, and her long hair streamed out behind her like a comet's tail. She was flogging the horse without mercy. Its nostrils were wide and red, and its sides were spotted with foam. It galloped madly up to the front door, missing the lamp post by an inch, and then reared up on its hind legs. The hansom crashed into the lamp post and shattered into several pieces. The witch, with a magnificent leap, had sprung clear just in time and landed on the horse's back. She settled herself astride and leaned forward, whispering things in its ear. They must have been things meant not to quiet it, but to madden it. It was on its hind legs again in a moment, and its neigh was like a scream. It was all hooves and teeth and eyes and tossing mane. Only a splendid rider could have stayed it on its back. Before Diggory had recovered his breath, a good many other things began to happen. A second handsome dashed up close behind the first. Out of it there jumped a fat man in a frock coat and a policeman. Then came a third handsome with two more policemen in it. After it came about twenty people, mostly errand boys, on bicycles, all ringing their bells and letting out cheers and catcalls. Last of all came a crowd of people on foot, all very hot with running, but obviously enjoying themselves. Windows shot up in all the houses of that street, and a housemaid or butler appeared at every front door. They wanted to see the fun. Meanwhile, an old gentleman had begun to struggle shakily out of the ruins of the first hansom. Several people rushed forward to help him, but as one pulled him one way and another another, perhaps he would have got out quite as quickly on his own. Diggory guessed that the old gentleman must be Uncle Andrew, but you couldn't see his face. His tall hat had been bashed down over it. Diggory rushed out and joined the crowd. "'That's the woman, that's the woman,' cried the fat man, pointing at Jadis. "'Do your duty, constable. Hundreds and thousands of pounds worth she's taken out of my shop. Look at that rope of pearls round her neck. That's mine. And she's given me a black eye, too, what's more.' "'That she has, governor,' said one of the crowd. "'And as lovely as black eye as I'd wish to see. Beautiful bit of work that must have been. Cor, ain't she strong, then?' "'You ought to put a nice raw beef stick on it, mister. That's what it wants,' said a butcher's boy. "'Now, then,' said the most important of the policemen, "'what's all this here?' "'I tell you, she—' began the fat man, when someone else called out. "'Don't let the old cove in the cab get away. E put her up to it.' The old gentleman, who was certainly Uncle Andrew, had just succeeded in standing up and was rubbing his bruises. "'Now, then,' said the policeman, turning to him, "'what's all this?' Wonful puffy shop came Uncle Andrew's voice from inside the hat. None of that now, said the policeman sternly. You'll find this is no laughing matter. Take that hat off, see? This was more easily said than done. But after Uncle Andrew had struggled in vain with the hat for some time, two other policemen seized it by the brim and forced it off. Thank you, thank you, said Uncle Andrew in a faint voice. Thank you. Dear me, I'm terribly shaken. If someone could give me a small glass of brandy... Now you attend to me, if you please, said the policeman, taking out a very large notebook and a very small pencil. Are you in charge of that there, young woman? Look out, cried several voices, and the policeman jumped a step backwards just in time. The horse had aimed a kick at him, which would probably have killed him. Then the witch wheeled the horse round so that she faced the crowd and his hind legs were on the footpath. She had a long, bright knife in her hand, and it had been busily cutting the horse free from the wreck of the handsome. All this time, Diggory had been trying to get into a position from which he could touch the witch. This wasn't at all easy, because, on the side nearest to him, there were too many people. And in order to get round to the other side, he had to pass between the horse's hoofs and the railing of the area that surrounded the house. For the Ketterly's house had a basement. If you know anything about horses and especially if you have seen what a state that horse was in at the moment, you will realize that this was a ticklish thing to do. Diggory knew lots about horses, but he set his teeth and got ready to make a dash for it as soon as he saw a favorable moment. A red-faced man in a bowler hat had now shouldered his way to the front of the crowd. Hi, policeman, he said. That's my horse what she's sitting on, same as it's my cab that she's made matchwood of. 
One at a time, please, one at a time, said the policeman. But there ain't no time, said the cabby. I know that horse better than you do. Tain't no ordinary horse. Its father was officer's charger in the cavalry, he was. And if the young woman goes on excitin' him, there'll be murder done. Here, let me get at him. The policeman was only too glad to have a good reason for standing further away from the horse. The cabby took a step nearer, looked up at Jadis, and said in a not unkindly voice, Now, Missy, let me get out of his head, and you just get off. You're a liddy, and I don't want all these roughs getting going for you, do you? You want to go home and have a nice cup of tea and lay down quiet-like, and then you'll feel ever so much better. At the same time, he stretched out his hand towards the horse's head with the words, Steady, strawberry, old boy. Steady now. Then, for the first time, the witch spoke. Dog, came her cold, clear voice, ringing loud above all the other noises. Dog, unhand our royal charger. We are the Empress Jadis.